welcome to another addictive episode of the Ocean Sailing Podcast with your host and sailing addict, David Howes. Hi folks and welcome to episode 15 of the Ocean Sailing Podcast. This week we're talking to Ian Thompson who is the organiser of the Around Australia race uh, to be held in August 2017. Uh, that 6,350 mile race will take competitors right around the country leaving Sydney August next year and Ian is the current solo record holder having uh, completed that course in 2012 uh, in, in a uh, 40 odd foot yacht so we talked to Ian about the race, about how it's come about, about his organisation, the Ocean Crusaders um, and find out a whole lot more about what he has planned ahead so it's a really good episode and I think you'll enjoy it. Um, also, we had lots of feedback from our listeners looking to be able to connect with each other. Uh, we've got listeners now in 59 countries around the world, so I have set up a Facebook group. So if you search on Ocean Sailing Podcast, you can join that group and uh, that will allow you to post, share, ask questions, share experience, um, and see the photos and experiences of some of our listeners and, uh, and things they're doing all over the world. So, so take advantage of that. Uh, this, this, uh, this week's episode is also the first episode we've uh, released a, a day or so late. Um, I'm currently in Melbourne Airport, having travelled the last uh, couple of days, uh, sitting in the uh, Virgin Lounge in a quiet space recording the intro for this uh, episode so I can get published before I fly. So uh, apologies for uh, putting it out day late. Uh, but uh, we'll see some show notes online in the next couple of days that that you'll find really, really complimentary as well in terms of images and, and uh, the transcription of this uh, episode with Ian Thompson. Um, so that'll be available online at the oceansailingpodcast.com website. So uh, enjoy this week's episode. Uh, so folks, welcome along to this week's episode of the Ocean Sailing Podcast. This week we're down on board uh, with Ian Thompson down at uh, RQ or Royal Queensland Yacht Squadron in the Marina. Uh, Ian, welcome along. Thank you. And uh, this week we're going to talk about the Around Australia race, which is uh, planned for, uh, I think, August next year. Yeah, 5th of August 2017. And uh, it's uh, just uh, something that's just been released in the last uh, couple of months. It's really topical, and uh, the race uh, last r- last ran in, in 1988. So it's been a it's been a long time between drinks. So, so Ian, tell me tell me a little bit about the the history of the race and and what what sort of motivated this this idea to to run it again after uh, all these years. Well, funny enough, uh, the initial race was run back in 1988 uh, in the bicentennial year, and. Uh, the name of it back then was the Goodman Fielder Watty Bicentennial Around Australia Yacht Race, which is a hell of a name for a race. Um, <laughs> how they promoted that, I've got no idea. Um, a friend of mine, Don McIntyre, who happened to own Jessica Watson's boat, um, also done the Bounty Boat uh, reenactment, quite an adventurer, runs out of Tonga, runs down to the ice every year. Um, incredible guy. Wow. He was the one who actually ran it back in 1988, and um, what a race. Like At the end of the day, um, Sir Peter Blake is the only winner of an Around Australia yacht race, so uh, to be able to put your name on a trophy next to Sir Peter Blake would be kind of pretty cool, I reckon. Um, But my motivation for it has been, I sailed around in 2010 solo, Uh, it was a dream of mine to do, and um, a lot of people have been inquiring. Um, with me as to whether I could run something or whether they should do it as themselves and actually sailing home recently from overseas I sailed through Fiji and actually caught up with Don McIntyre we were talking about his uh, 2018 Golden Globe race which is the 50th anniversary of when Sir Robin Knox Johnson sailed around the world Wow! and he said oh yeah I'd love to run an around Australia yacht race but I don't have the time and I said to him, well, it'd be really cool if you had someone who's done that track uh, to promote it, wouldn't it? And he's like, yeah, you'd be perfect. And <laughs> it's something I've been thinking of for a while. And just Don tri- tipped me over the line and said he'd support us 100%. 
So whilst he can't do it himself, uh, he's there in the background helping us. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, so putting on a race, um, probably the motivation behind the race is a little bit different to most other races in the fact that we're trying to help people achieve their dreams rather than just running a race to make a million dollars. And that's why we can make it affordable for, for sailors, not mm -hmm. charging 25000 like a, a prior attempt tried to do. Okay, and so at 6,350 nautical miles, it's, a, it's the longest coastal race in the world. And it's, it's virtually the equivalent of sailing from you know, Sydney to Los Angeles across the Pacific. And so it kind of puts it into context. Yeah, it's pretty much, it, it's it's a long way. Um, and the conditions you're going to face around the country, uh, well, I was fortunate enough when I went round to sail, 78% of it had the wind behind the beam. So it is good weather, but once you get to the West Coast, anything can happen. Mm -hmm. And of course, you got the Southern Ocean leg there from uh, Cape Lewin across to the bottom of Tasmania, which, well, the Southern Ocean can throw anything at you. Um, I had everything. I had storms. I had nothing. Wow. So, yeah. It's an awesome track. Um, takes you through the warm, takes you through the cold. Um, I'm sure most people will enjoy the warmth at that time of year, but won't mm -hmm. appreciate the Southern Ocean at that time of year either. But, hey, that's part of sailing. And uh, how did you choose August? Does that, does that help weather-wise or climatically to start the race at that time of the year in Sydney? Uh, look, if you're going for an outright record, um, I would say you would go earlier. Mm -hmm. But you'd be pretty silly to put a fleet through the Southern Ocean in July mm. um, just for, well, for every reason. But also the, the winds are getting later and later now. Like uh, we're still copping southeast, uh, well, sorry, the, the, the lows off the coast here, um, which are throwing northerlies at us as we speak. So we don't need that no. to sail up the <laughs> east coast on northerlies. Um, so, you know, hopefully August next year, who knows, the weather could do anything. Um, but if we can get a nice high sitting in the middle of Australia, you sail around it. Mm -hmm. And that almost times almost times to the day with the start of the Sydney to Southport race. Is that just a coincidence? or? It's a week after the Sydney to Southport. Right, okay. Um, it was deliberately done a week after. Mm -hmm. um, Sydney to Southport, I've been in the yachting industry before, and the Sydney Boat Show is always on the same time that that race is on. Right. So selling yachts and wanting to race, you can't do both. Mm -hmm. So we decided to go afterwards. We don't want to compete against these other races, but at the end of the day, we'll only run every four or five years. Yeah. Um, so, you know, obviously we're taking people away from Early Beach Race Week and Hamo Race Week, which we didn't really want to do. It'd be great if you could run at Easter, but the weather at Easter is just not good enough to do that. So. Yeah. Um, you have to run it. Um, it's an event a lot of people want to do, and hopefully we can get a you know a good fleet of boats on the line that are happy to do that. And uh, apologise to all the other yacht racers if I take people away from them. I uh, hope they don't see it that way. Hope they see it as just once every four years we'll get people down. Sydney to Southport, we could bring boats from overseas that could do a Hobart. So might yeah. take away from one, but may add to another. Yeah, absolutely. And well, and the thing is too, if you like the way I look at it is if if you track, attract a lot of um, not you know amateur racers or people that you know don't do it for a day job, many of their crews can't do everything anyway. Um, so they're going to have to make choices between what they do in terms of time off. So technically, even if you ran the event at a different time of the year, there'll be a whole lot of boats where the crew will say, "Well, we can't do Eagerly Beach and Hamo, and do this race week and and fit in family and work." So. That, that trade-off's going to be there to some degree, regardless of timing, I think. Um, Wouldn't it be lovely if we could all just race yachts for a living? Um, <laughs> you know, that would be awesome. But uh, no, as you say, like, you know, if we run it in the middle of the year, we're going to take boats away from the winter series that clubs run. Mm. Um, so there's always going to be something you're going to conflict against. We're very aware of trying not to conflict against the Volvo Ocean Race. Um, because our Ocean Crusaders campaign is trying to get a leg in there. Um, mm -hmm. So we'd love to head straight from finishing this race over to Alicante and run around with the Volvo Ocean Race with Ocean Crusaders pushing our environmental message. Mm -hmm. We don't want to clash with the Golden Globe because that's Don's pet and uh, that's something we're also looking to be involved in. And 2019 is a long way away. So, uh, yeah. yeah, you know, um, 2017 is the goal. And uh, I think, you know, most boats 
We'll make it round anywhere between 30 and 60 days around the country. Mm-hmm. Um, obviously, with the eight days stopping, a unique feature of any sort of race. Mm. Um, yeah, who knows? Okay, so so at least just sort of jump sideways into Ocean Crusaders. Tell me about that. Um, I read some interesting um, interesting facts on, online on, on, on what's out there in the ocean that a lot of us, even sailors, probably take for granted. So tell us about that. It all started back in 2010. I picked up my eighth turtle out of the ocean when I was a skipper up in the Wet Sundays, and I, I just got over it. I, like picking him up, finding out they died because of plastic or plastic bags in particular, it was just killing me because that's what we loved going and seeing. And so I actually sailed around in 2010 to raise awareness of that. Mm-hmm. And okay, it was a bit of a dream to sail around the country, but to do it to raise awareness was a really key thing. So off the back of that, um, you know. I ended up launching what is now Ocean Crusaders. Back then it was Save Our Seas Australia. But um, Ocean Crusaders has been, you know, it's morphing into something quite big, into 18,000 schools through our online mm. project. Um, so it, it's an awesome thing. But the issue in the ocean is, is it's unheard of. Like, people don't realise what is actually going on out there. We go to the shops, we pick up our plastic bags, or they're almost thrown at us. Yeah. We pick up our milk in plastic containers. We pick up water in plastic bottles. And a lot of it does go to recycling, but we're only talking 38% here in Australia goes into recycling wow. PET products. Plastic bags, we don't have the recycling facilities here to do it. So mm. the, the amount of rubbish out there, they're talking over 53 trillion pieces of plastic now, all breaking into smaller and smaller pieces. And yeah, everyone talks about the North Pacific garbage patch. But that's only one of the five mm. gyres out there. Um, you can't see it, most of it, because it's so small. It's in microplastic sizes these days, the same size as plankton. So 95% of the fish we're eating have plastic inside them. Or they're consuming plastic out there, so we're consuming plastic. Mm. Massive issue. So, yeah, the Ocean Crusaders side of things runs off along in the background, as I say, into 18,000 schools with our online education program last year. It's growing again this year. Um, we're getting a lot of interest from you know other yacht races like for our environmental campaign because we're sailors mm-hmm. to be involved. Um, so yeah, we're trying to get the message out there, do our little bit, um, whatever we can. But uh, obviously, this yacht race uh, being run by me is going to have some you know unique features to it, and that includes a, a set of special environmental regulations which will ban provisioning your boat with plastic bags. Mm. You won't be able to have single-use plastic water bottles on board. So the smallest water container in plastic you'll be able to use will be a 10 litre. So you have to refill your bottles. Mm. Um, As part of the entry fee, like each crew member will get a race shirt and a stainless steel water bottle so that they can actually refill those and use them. So you don't end up with all these plastic water bottles in your oat bags at the end of the race, mostly half drunk. No one knows whose is whose. It's one of those crazy things. And we keep doing it. People go on racing and they've got plastic forks to eat and they just one use, bang, in the bin. Mm. Um, people have been throwing aluminium cans overboard for years thinking, oh, well, it's aluminium, it'll go. People don't understand aluminium cans have a layer of plastic inside them. Otherwise, all the fizzy drinks, we know Coke, what it does to your teeth. Yeah. It would eat through the aluminium can. Right, so this is the assumption that it would just break down and disappear, but that's not the case, right? With they, the, with they, the lining. they will eventually, but the plastic parts will actually end up in the ocean. Yeah, um, right. But it still takes like something like 400 years for that can to actually completely disappear. Wow. But the plastic won't. Wow. So throwing an aluminium can in the ocean isn't good. I was speaking to someone the other day saying that they're happy to throw glass in the ocean because it's made from sand. I don't even know how to respond to that because, I mean, where is the mentality that says that's okay? Yeah. Let's recycle it. Let's reuse that product mm. so we don't have to keep pulling sand out of our up our beaches. Mm. Um, yeah, we've just got to start getting a lot smarter um, and less lazy, I think. So this race hopefully will change the way we go sailing. Well, it's really interesting. I mean, you've touched on a number of different topics there. Uh how, how did you reach 18,000 schools? How, how did that come about? That's, that's no mean feat when you think about, even if you think about 1,000 kids in a school, you know, you're talking about, what, 18 million young people. Um, you know, that's a, that's, a, that's a big reach. It's starting to get, um, yeah, it's, look, 
in the five years since we've had the online education program going, it's it's been stunning, the growth. It sort of triples every year. Mm. Um, we started off visiting schools after I went around Australia, and then I realised I couldn't visit a lot of schools because you visit one school a day. Yeah. Um, and, of course, it costs money, and we weren't getting funding in. Yeah. So we put the program online. Mm-hmm. Um, 13 pro- uh, lessons here in Australia, uh, ranging in topics from an overall general plastics as the introduction, and then there's one on plastic water bottles, there's one on turtles, seals, whales, dolphins, sharks, albatross. Mm-hmm. Um, so there's all these different lessons. And then we do email marketing out there where, as our money comes in, which is very little. Um, the big growth came when Sean Manchester, one of the guys from America, Mm-hmm. And he sailed in the clip around the world yacht race. Mm-hmm. He only done did one leg, which I think was Florida, uh, sorry, to Florida from San Francisco, which was 5,100 nautical miles. And he raised a dollar for every mile he did for Ocean Crusaders. Wow. That $5,000 ended up being put back into an email, email marketing campaign in America. We grew like over 10,000 schools in America in a year. Just wow. from one email marketing campaign. And, and then you get to that tipping point where so many people start to know about it and they start to tell others and it starts to it's, take it's on a life of its own. It's interesting because, unfortunately, um, I'm not that computer savvy of how to get statistics back and, and Don picked this up that we've got 18,000 schools who have downloaded the program last year. That doesn't take into account the people who have already downloaded it in the past. Yeah, right. Who could still be using the same program because you download it onto your computer. Mm-hmm. And you can use it time you and time again. You can just use it over and over. So that's 18,000 new schools last year. Yeah, right. It's not 18,000 schools. So we could be somewhere a lot higher than that. Mm-hmm. And I don't know how to work out how to you know, work out who is using it every year. Uh-huh. Um, so we're working on how we can do that. Whether it's kids signing a contract committing to no plastic bags for the year and they sign it each year and... After three years, they get a T-shirt from Ocean Crusaders. Don't know. Yeah, some some good things you can potentially do there with that information. Will then probably start to help you get, gather more support to help spread the word wider once you yeah. understand the reach. Because potentially, you say, could be quite large without really even knowing. Yeah, one of the things we struggle with is funding uh, for Ocean Crusaders, being a not-for-profit organisation. Um, recently, we've been looking at trying to get funding. But because we've got no quantitative measures of our impact, yeah, we struggle to get funding. Yet the people who are cleaning up beaches and pulling tons and tons of rubbish off the beaches are getting hundreds, if not millions of dollars from our government, which makes no sense at all. It's so like working We're at the bottom of the cliff, right? Where they, after it's already turned to custard and cleaning up the problem rather than preventing it we teach the kids prevention is better than a cure we mm. all learnt that at school mm. and yet the government's funding the cure Cause which it's is clean visible. it up yeah. um, which makes no sense and we can't get funding to go and keep campaigning as I say 5,000 US dollars and we get over 10,000 new schools Yeah, bang like that but then it does snowball well and, the, and like, like you say if you if you look at supermarket shelves now, there's there's bays allocated to 24 packs of water bottles, and the irony is we live in a country where water's on tap for you know 99 percent of the population. You know, there's countries where they just happily have clean water, yet we've got to go now buy it on water bottles instead of taking it out of our taps. And I read recently that uh, RQ Royal Queensland Yacht Squadron are looking to change their sailing rules to pro- to prohibit use of disposable plastic bottles on boats when you're racing. Is that, is that something you've had a hand to play? Yeah. Um, no, t- to be honest, no. Um, we helped promote the fact that they've made the decision, but they've actually made it off their own back. When we got back from our trip overseas, we, mm-hmm. we came to RQ and um, we know quite a few people here and they said, oh, you know, like they're, they're going plastic bottle free here at RQ. And I'm like, well, that's awesome. Like, let's promote it like, because no one knows about it. Yeah. Um, they're following the Royal Hong Kong Yacht Club who did it. Right. They've been over there and seen one of these massive yacht clubs, which is now a host to the Volvo Ocean Race. Um, they're doing it, and so RQ have gone, well, maybe we should too. Mm. It's a huge thing. If we can get that done, Like um, we've just got to find a way for them to do it where we can cater. We've just had um, the junior sail week here, and there's a lot of kids on off the beach, so you've just got to make sure that we can provide for those kids so we don't have thirsty sailors. Yeah. 
Um, a lot of the senior sailors, that's all right. They usually drink beer anyway rather than water. So, um, <laughs> But at the end of the day, um, yeah, we've just got to make sure we can set it up so that it, it works. Cause you well, don't theoretically, want it to though, be wrong. 50 years ago when kids sailed before the days of disposable water bottles or throwaway water bottles, they drank water somehow, didn't they? <laughs> yeah, yeah, we all used to do it. We also <laughs> used to be able to get our groceries home without plastic bags. Yeah. Uh, they were called the boxes that everything goes into the shop in. Mm. Um, you pick them up at the door. Um, well, that's the good, it's a good point. I mean, theoretically, the same number of boxes that takes those items into the supermarket, the same number of boxes you need to take them out again, right? Yeah, we shouldn't. In theory. We shouldn't really be... You know, well, they just crush them. Yeah, um, they just they, go to, go to they waste, put them into bales, but... You look at what Dan Murphy's does. Not necessarily a good cause, but you, you get you get your box at the back of the checkout and you pack your wine in and away you go. You don't Absolutely. even keep your plastic bags. That's just logical. We've just mm. got lazy. Um, unfortunately, the supermarkets, are, it's a cost thing. Yeah. Because It's a biggest, productivity issue too, right? And the, that, their biggest cost is the checkout person. Mm. Getting someone through the checkout as quick as possible. And unfortunately, at the moment, plastic bags, all one size that they can just pull out on those little stands fill up that's quicker yeah than us taking our own bags yeah but um you what you're starting to see overseas is um cities cities that are starting to ban plastic and and force the change from bylaw level to say within five years you won't have plastic bags and plastic bottles and what have you so some of those things aren't going to come out of self-motivated commercial agendas are they you know if push comes to shove no. a bit like a bit like all the other stuff with the you know carbon trading and <coughs> emissions and you know sometimes it does take a bit of brute force from government to, to start to we, force the change but we wrote a letter a long time ago to the government saying like why don't you ban plastic bags and they said it costs too much we spend millions every year on banning like cleaning up the problem mm. but they say it's too much to ban well how much does it cost to make a legislation um, yeah it's a bit of words on a few pieces of paper and get a few people to tick it and that's in yeah, it's too hard to risk all those votes for those lazy people who wouldn't want to change in the short term from place to place no, issues. No, I don't think it's that. I think it's how much will it cost their government because most of their campaigns are funded by the oil companies that right. make plastic. Yeah, right. So, so it's not about the people. Like, people, hey, we deal with whatever we're given. Mm. Whatever government we get soon, mm. if we get one, um, we have to deal with whatever they put in place. Uh, and you learn to live with it. You have to. Otherwise, what are you going to do? Uh, complaining yeah. no one listens, really. Yeah, well, that's right. We're, um, I mean, the only is we, I, I never used plastic water bottles when I was racing. Um, and maybe 18 months ago, we started buying them. And now half our rubbish bags just plastic bottles. And we were planning some multi-day stuff recently. And one of our crew said, we've got these water tanks. Why do we fill up the bag with disposable bottles? Why don't we just take a water bottle each? And if you don't like the taste of the water in the water tanks, which is tap water, just put a carbon filter on your on your sink tap and it'll taste great. Yep. You know, 90 bucks from Bunnings. 100 years ago, if you said you can have a boat with water tanks and just have, fill up your bottle whenever you want, people would have gone, wow. And now we go back to uh, taking taking bottled water along that we can fill up our rubbish bags with. So. There's still countries out there who would sit there and come on a boat, like you know, your boat and like my boat, and just go, wow, wow, you've got... You've got a sink, you've got a stove, you've got running water, you've got hot water. Yeah. I mean, there's people who live in villages like that don't have that. You've got a cutlery drawer, so why would you throw disposable plastic cutlery away when you can just use what's in your drawer? <laughs> exactly. So we're a wasteful society and it's because we're lazy, so we've just got to get over it. Mm-hmm. Okay. So so you're currently the solo around Australia mono, mono hull record holder. So how, how did that adventure come about? Because that's, that's no mean feat to do it solo given... Unlike crossing the ocean, you spend a lot of the time close to the coast, close to other recreational and commercial traffic, and there's lots of lots of hard stuff to run into, right, if you um, go the wrong way at the wrong time? Yes, there's lots of hard <laughs> stuff to run into. Um, I didn't hit anything, thank God. Um, electronics is the only way you can do things solo these days. <clears throat> I was lucky that um, I had Furuno sponsor us. Mm-hmm. Um, the Furuno radar overlaying onto the plotter with all the alarms if rain clouds came close they'd come up on the radar set off an alarm I'd wake up but the longest sleep I had in 42 days was 26 minutes so wow. the average sleep was usually 20 minutes I'd sleep for 20 minutes get up, check everything yeah I might go straight back to sleep for another 20 minutes but it's pretty full on Running two-handed would be a hell of a lot easier and a hell of a lot faster 
Yeah. Because you can run spinnakers all night because someone's on deck watching the whole time. Mm -hmm. I didn't. I'd slow down, like, at night time, like, to make it safe. Like, if there's rain in the area, I wouldn't have a spinnaker up. Um, it, it, it's a lot of uh, full-on-to-sail solo, and these guys who sail around the world on those Imica 60s with foils, I mean... That's unreal, isn't it? Insanity is probably the word. Um, I realised when I got back that 42 days by yourself isn't a, a good thing in, in life. <laughs> um, it's sort of people, you, you know, they're we're meant to be with other people mm. so yeah pretty full on achievement but doing that is nothing compared to what our oceans are facing and that was the message of why I did it mm -hmm. you know the ocean are facing a much bigger battle than 42 days mm. it's going to take a lot longer than 42 days to clean up our oceans well because the problem's not standing <laughs> still right um, with population growth and then with some of the countries that just literally bulldoze their waste into the ocean um, there's a lot of there's a lot of uh, long way to go before we stop stop con contributing to the problem. Yeah, I mean, and when we consider that China's producing 27 percent of the plastic that's in the ocean, um, you know, China's a big hit. And I remember talking to the guys over at Volvo Ocean Race, and they said to us, they went to China obviously in the last edition, and they said, okay, we want to do a beach clean. Mm -hmm. So they're like, no, we don't need to clean beaches because our beaches are clean, and the Chinese like government's just not admitting they've got a problem wow. and Volvo said well okay no but we want to come and if there's no rubbish to pick up that's awesome we can promote that fantastic and so eventually they agreed that um, they'd be able to do this clean up six o'clock in the morning the Chinese army went down and cleaned the beach that the Volvo team were going to go and pick up the rubbish off wow. so by eight o'clock when they got there there was no rubbish on the beach because the army had already picked it all up so it kind of gives you an idea of like China doesn't want the reputation of creating all this plastic, but they are. Yeah. And until you admit you've got a problem, you're not going to fix it. Yeah, I mean we're pretty critical of North Korea, but that's um, there's a little bit of denial there, isn't there, in terms of that example? A little um, bit an understatement. Keep, yeah. Keeping up a public facade that's quite transparent, and well, not not transparent, but it's, you can see straight through it. Yeah, absolutely. And so you know that's what we're facing. Mm. You know, companies and, and governments that are doing that our own government that says it's too expensive yet will spend millions of dollars cleaning up the problem yeah it's just let, let's get to the source of the problem and that is just making a few decisions making a few changes getting rid of lazy people mm. um, you know let, let's do something it's it can be done San Francisco has just banned styrofoam there's no more styrofoam cups. There's no more styrofoam like burger boxes or anything mm. like that. What a fantastic initiative. Why can't other governments do that? And if it's so expensive for us to ban plastic bags, how does South Australia and Northern Territory and Tasmania do it? Well, ex exactly. Yeah, and you give you give people choices, and they'll either they'll either recycle or they'll pay extra for not recycling by buying paper alternatives or other alternatives and. You, you change. If take you take away change, the lazy option and people don't have the option anymore. If you have to change, you will. Mm. Yeah, that's right. That's so. right. Okay, so so your last trip around the country, I mean, doing it solo is pretty significant. Like you say, even having a second crew member is probably like having five more crew members in terms of the perceived difference it can make. I mean, what what were the key lessons out of that, that you took out of the preparation that you did that made, made that possible? Um, pretty much like the... Making sure you've got all your electronics running properly. I mean, my, my trip was meant to be non-stop unassisted. It didn't end up that because coming across Bass Strait, um, I had a, a fan belt broke. Mm -hmm. I put the spare one on. Must have been petrified because it lasts less than 24 hours. I didn't have a third one. So I ended up having to pull into Sydney. Mm -hmm. <coughs> um Pulling into Sydney meant that I was no longer non-stop unassisted, but I was going to Captain Cook it up the coast. Um, I literally was. I actually have the ability to do that, yeah. And because you're coastal, you can get your line of sights, and I had the charts. Yeah. I had a handheld um, GPS, so I was, wasn't quite Captain Cooking it, but, you know, I would have done all right. Um, the problem was, like, um, when I was not sleeping and I couldn't have my radar and my alarm set anymore, and mm. I... Literally at one stage, I woke up, came outside, make sure there was nothing around, and there was a super tanker 50 metres beside me. 
and that scared the living bejesus out of me mm. and that was it um as a commercial skipper i couldn't go running into a ship putting other people's lives at risk so mm. you just couldn't do it so i had to stop um you know records are one thing but you know safety of life is the biggest thing mm. to anyone and i wouldn't be able to live with myself if i hit some other boat and you know, killed someone or anything like that so it's not great for your family either to leave so, uh, and, and that it's, way. it was interesting because i probably got more um credit from people in the sailing industry for actually stopping and making that decision for safety than if i'd pushed on and actually got the record mm. so you know i mean in this race like we're coming up like, you know safety is always going to be a paramount thing and one of the cool things with the pit stop version of the race where you can take your eight days wherever you like mm, i love that part that if you have a problem you can go in and get it fixed yeah so, it's like having money in the bank isn't it and you just got to choose when, when and how you spend it or whether you save it till the till the end and enjoy it all at once <laughs> mass, massive tactical like decision for weather mm. but it does get give you a get out of jail club clause you know if you tear your mainsail in half yeah like in the last hobart how many boats pulled out because of torn mainsails yeah well this option is well you sail into the ne nearest port yeah get it fixed and off you go again yeah um so yeah to me that that was a really cool feature it was actually don mcintyre's idea like of how to run it learning from his original race mm -hmm. um so yeah i, I like that um eight days I don't even know how Don came up with eight days, and I don't know why I didn't change it. It's just, oh, that sounds good. Happy days, eight days. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's probably a kind of a day a week kind of thing almost, isn't it? Um, yeah, like I uh, wanted to take me seven seven weeks to get around. Um, sorry, six weeks. Six weeks to get around. Um, so, yeah, it is sort of a day a week. Um, yeah. Well, what I, when I saw it, the thing that instantly struck me was, wow, this is actually doable with a volunteer crew who have day jobs and lives because they can join you for one leg or two legs or three legs because depending on how you use those days you, you might say we've got you know four you know i don't know 12 day legs and, and any anyone potentially can join you for 12 days but they couldn't do the whole race so the ability for crew to swap out at certain changeover points and and you to have some reserve days for you know things that come up that break or need attention it just gives you a whole lot of flexibility that that you wouldn't have if you had to say find people who want to do a you know 45 50 day race yeah. and take two months out of their lives um absolutely and i mean we had a phone call and i hope this comes off because it'll be awesome for the race and awesome for the the program but dave pescard from uh, sailors with disabilities mm -hmm. currently owns the uh, non-stop fully crewed record around australia for a monohull uh, with the sailors with disabilities program wow and he's been in touch and he loves the whole stopping concept because it means they can go into port, they can get promotion at that port, they can swap crew over, get sailors with disabilities from that region to, to sail the next leg. So if they come on board, like fingers crossed that their committee allows it and we yeah. can find some funding for them even. Like, you know, if you're out there listening, awesome program. Changes people's lives if they had the funding to do this race, imagine what that would do for those people. Mm. I was in the race. I've raced around Australia. Huge thing for someone who's like able-bodied, let alone disabled. Well, and there'll be some, <coughs> there'll be some stat somewhere that says there's more people been to the moon already than they have, than they have sailed around Australia. So it's, it's, it's no mean feat when you think about some of the adversity that you face with some of the, some of the weather and some of the legs, especially down south. Absolutely, and I mean, one of the ambassadors of the Ocean Crusaders program, and I'm still yet to get in touch with him, Jamie Dunross. Mm -hmm. In 2010, when I was sailing around Australia, Jamie was too. And Jamie was doing it on a little S&S 34, same thing that oh, yeah. um, Jessica popular, Watson popular went model. <laughs> Yeah, and his was yellow, not pink like Jessica's. And um, he was doing it with stops. But you sit there and go, okay, well, you know, a guy sailing around the country, stopping by himself, no problems. Then you hear the guy's story. He's a C5 quadriplegic. It takes him 40 minutes to get to the bow and back on a 34-foot yacht. Wow. The guy has so little, like, um, movement in his arms and legs that the whole interior of his boat was actually padded because he can't hang on if a boat rolls. Mm. He can't come into a port and tie up without 
um, you know, someone to help him because he can't be on the tiller and just quickly run up to the bow mm -hmm. and 40 minutes later your boat will be in the next marina. Like, yeah. Um, so, you know, what a legend. Like, he sailed around and if you actually took out the days of his stops, he's the second fastest person to sail around the country. Wow, that's no mean feat. Um, For a C5 quadriplegic, what? like, he's an absolute dead set legend. Um, and inspiration for anyone who's thinking of doing this race he did it as a C5 quadriplegic with mm. stops well, and, and most of us grumble because it takes us 20 minutes to get our weather gear on and off yeah, and we have to worry about leaping up the stairs into the cockpit in a hurry I mean yeah. that's a huge barrier uh, for somebody to have to deal with um, with a race like that yeah, just to set his boat up with systems like to get him up and down a companion way like you know we just walk up and down the companion way. Like, he has to have a full system to lift him up there. Yeah. He even had a system set up to go up the mast. Wow. That's, uh, that's I mean, that's amazing to, to just have the guts to do something like that with the limited movement. Um, I'm not the best with heights on a good day, let alone the fact that, you know, you're completely reliant on technology to get you there and no ability to naturally grab on in a hurry. Um, that's, that's incredible. Yeah, so, I mean... You talk of inspirations in your life to do things and, you know, I mean, for me running this race is about allowing people to achieve their dreams. Mm. And so many people want to do it. Um, you're our third entry, but the two first entries, really? both of those boats wow. had actually been custom built mm -hmm. for this race. The first one was built for the 88 Bicentennial race. Mm -hmm. um, that's the, the 50 foot uh, Crowther Cat Top Gun. Mm-hmm. It was built back in uh, 87 to go in the first race. It didn't make it because of funding issues. Mm -hmm. It was then bought by somebody else to do the race that didn't happen in 2014. And now we've got the new owner who's hopefully third time lucky will actually get it around the country. Uh, and then the other boat is Tam Faha's 50-foot Karumba. Absolutely mm -hmm. stunning Kerr boat. Um, beautiful boat. Mm. Built it to do what was meant to be the 2014 race. Obviously never went ahead, and so now he was our first entry because as soon as he heard about it, he was like, yep, okay, we're in. No hesitation. It's just what his boat was built for. It's a dream for these people. Mm. I mean, Karumba, I don't know how much it costs, but it's not a cheap boat. Mm. It's a nice, but it's a beautiful boat. Absolutely stunning boat. And for him to have built a boat for this event and not be able to do it, that would have hurt. Now he's got an opportunity to do it. And we've got three boats now. We've got a race. Wow, because I entered last night. You so. entered last night, and um, I love the fact that your boat's not a full-blown race boat. The other two, are, well, okay, the catamaran's a full-blown race boat. Carumba's a race boat on the outside, but really nice downstairs. And, <laughs> and you've got the more cruisy version of a boat. Yeah. And it shows it doesn't matter what boat you've got. We've had interest from a guy who owns... Um, an old Harishoff 70 year old boat and it's mm -hmm. the smallest boat um, to have competed in the Sydney to Hobart he raced five times in the 50s and he's looking at going around on that That'd be, isn't that cool to get some of those iconic type boats back for something like this um, That that's that's really creates a, a special race well something I'm really focused on because I really hate the Hobart every year because it's all about the maxis mm. um, that's right it's, the television viewers who don't sail would think that there's only five boats in the race or, or that all the boats in the race are 100 footers because that's the coverage, right? <laughs> and they're all multi-millionaires and, you know, it doesn't matter. Like, you know, all their crew get $20,000 to go to Hobart. Yeah. Um, but you get, you know, Maluka of Kermody, who's, um, you know, Sean Langman's boat that's so small and timber and takes nearly to New Year's to get to Hobart. Yeah. Some say it's kind of like golf. They're out there longer so they get more enjoyment. Don't know about that because going to Hobart, it's the wrong <laughs> Depending way. Depending on the weather that you're um, enjoying. But, you know, at, at the end of the day, like, we are dead set certain we will promote every single boat in this race. Everyone will have sponsors. If they're sailing for a cause, we'll be right behind them 100%. Mm. Every boat will get coverage. If we get TV for the start, they'll, they will actually run separate starts if we have to to ensure that every boat gets coverage mm. and what if they cool start point. focusing on the big maxi boats like they'll have me in their ear very quickly <laughs> saying 
get off them. Like, it's not about them. It's about everybody living a dream. Yeah. Well, it's a... I mean, it's really struck me as a, you know, horses for courses type of event because you're you're going you're gonna to attract shorthanded crews that want to go non-stop on monos or multis. Um, but but also, all of those crews that are out there that, that can make it work because of the eight-day ability to stop for eight days um, during throughout the course of the race to change crews, repair damage, replenish provisions. I, I think that makes it work. And I think that um, when I thought about it like last night, I thought, what, what, what's the, what, what is it about this that's kind of the magic ingredient? And I think, I think there's this whole bunch of sailors who, you know, sail up and down the coast and never want to get out of sight of the land. And they look at the round the world sailors and say, well, that'd be cool to do someday, but I'll never do it because of time, cost, money, logistics. I can't take, you know, 10 months out of my life or what have you. Um, and you look at this race, you, you're, at, you're, you know, within a stone's throw of the coast, even though it's probably out of sight sometimes. But it's a, it's, it's, it's a long race. But even the cost of getting crew from one side of the country to the other to get on and get off is not that significant, um, you know, versus getting them to the other side of the world. Um, it really has got all the, all the ingredients of a, of a great sort of, ocean race with all sorts of challenges and, and, and different legs and different stops and different dimensions but but it's actually within reach of a, a lot of people i think from a from an affordability but but more importantly time you know you can take a couple of months out of your life and do something like this but most of us couldn't take you know nine or 12 months or 18 months as it turns into when you're preparing for something bigger and all the preparation that goes in so it kind of struck me as this sort of it's big enough to be challenging and you wouldn't want to do it every year but it's uh, it's one of those things that if you did it once in your life or twice in your life you'd think it was it's a pretty amazing way to see the country as well. Yeah, and we've also we're trying to open it up to as many people as we can. Uh, obviously, for safety side of things, we had to put an age barrier on it, but we did actually drop that down to sixteen. Mm -hmm. um, it's a lot of sixteen-year-old kids who are damn good sailors. Mm -hmm. um, and Jessica went around the world when she was sixteen, so yeah. people can sail at that age. Um, and if you've got a 16 year old kid who wants to sail around the country with you what a great thing to do when you're 16 mm. we took the size restrictions off that most races have these days and I'm talking about top end and bottom end mm. because you've got the mini transat boats mini transat boats 6.5 metres can't do a Hobart but they can cross the Atlantic yeah that's, that's um, an odd one isn't it that anomaly you know, and we've had an inquiry from a couple already that love the stops thing because on a six and a half metre boat being able to stop and <laughs> reprovision is probably a good well, thing well you can't take it all with you out front can you not easily without having a severe weight issue with ha handicap wise well you can and obviously they do it across the but Atlantic it's, it's a but, lot tougher um, when you're yeah, eating out of a packet all the time it might be nice to stop and have a good steak meal uh, yeah. um, and you know even a few cold beers or anything cold for that matter because they don't have fridges on those boats but mm -hmm. yeah just being able to open it up Two smaller boats. Obviously, the big boats. <coughs> Pardon me. Um, the outright records held by a 110-foot trimaran. Um, you know, imagine if Spindrift 2 wants to come down here, 135-foot, 130-foot, makes mm. a trimaran and do it. And mm. Fantastic. But the other thing, uh, the shorthanded version, we have the um, Melbourne to Osaka that starts in March 2018. Mm -hmm. so to come out here to Australia do the around Australia hang around, do a Hobart with a few extra crew and then go back to Melbourne do the, the race week in Melbourne um, Victoria Sailing Week or whatever they call it these days mm -hmm. and then line up and go back to Japan you're back in the Northern Hemisphere so hopefully we can drag a few international entrants mm. on that basis yeah, it's nice if the timing feeds into other things and yeah. makes it all work so you, you wouldn't have that um you know, if you did it in 2019, it would be the wrong time of the year. So. Okay, and so what's your what's your vision? And do you see this This is the start of something new that then starts to run every four years or, you know, some sort of frequency and starts to take on a life of its own and get, gather momentum? And Absolutely. We'd love it to become a permanent race um, and grow into one of the legendary races that you want to do in your life. Um Round Island Yacht Race just had 300 entries or something. Don't think we'll ever get that many, but um, you can dream. Who knows? You right. can dream of it. Could start somewhere. <laughs> so, timing-wise, how many years between? I don't know, to be honest. Mm -hmm. um, we'll talk to the sailors who enter this event afterwards and say, what do you think? Um, we're listening to the sailors in this event. We just want to 
listen to what they their thoughts are. If they like some things, great. If they don't, we'll change them. Yeah, I saw some interesting commentary. Um, I think you might have said that people have already raised raised questions about the the fuel restrictions and part of the environmental approaches is whatever whatever fuel you leave with is what you've got to take around the country. And if you if you think on one hand about solar and and um, wind generators <coughs> and the you know the the hydro ones you can tow through the water, then from a self sufficiency point of view, the the options are there. Um, and, and I think you got rounded about with 180 odd liters. I think when you went round, um, what what's the pushback been? Because I, I didn't see that as unreasonable when when uh, when I when I read that in, as part of the conditions. I think some people are looking at what they've used in other races um, and haven't even thought about the alternatives because they've all spoken to me before that article was put out about the environmental side of things, mm-hmm. um, which we just wanted to hold back a little bit as to why we put them in there. Mm-hmm. Um, but. It's, it's like the plastic bag thing, really. Why do you want to get rid of plastic bags? Because we don't need them. Why do you want to restrict fuel? We don't need it. We don't need fossil fuels. Teslas can drive around the country like on a battery. Yeah, um, that's right. You know, we got solar and, by oh jeez, Australia sailing around the country. You're not going to see too many cloudy days apart from the Southern Ocean. Plus, we're sailing, right? We're not motoring. That's the, that's the primary goal. That's the other thing. You know what I mean, we, we sailed back from Croatia to Australia with solar and wind, and we could sail, like, when we're sailing, you know, if the wind was 15 knots, with the wind generator and the sun during the day, we didn't need anything. At night time, we might have to throw the engine on for a couple of hours, mm-hmm. which is two litres of fuel a day. Mm-hmm. It's not a lot. The hydro generators... These are improving. Costs are coming down. Um, <coughs> um, just spoken to a company, and it's likely we will have them on board with a discount. If you want to grab some water, we can just yeah. take a break. Stop it. Back. Just yeah. Checked up. <coughs> yeah, that's all right. Um, I have. Okay. And um, and also, also when you're sailing, it's kind of annoying putting the engine on if you don't have to. It's even just the, the sound interruption, um, let alone the fact you're wasting fuel and running an engine which doesn't really like just idling. And you know, yeah. I've always talked about the R factor of sailing of when you turn that engine off and you mm. got that silence and all of a sudden it's like, ah. yeah. But um, you know, the hydro generators that um, are coming out these days, they're they're getting better and better. And we've got uh, a company Watt and Sea that are likely to come on board and offer a discount to our entrance on their systems. Now, someone said to me, oh, you know, they cost a fortune. Like, they're like 12 grand. They're down to under six, like under six grand these days. Mm-hmm. I think it's $5,200 for the new Watt and C um, hydro generator. It's 300 watt. So, wow, that's pretty mm. substantial. Well, I mean, I've just put three solar panels on, and they're me- 1.2 meters by 800 millimeters and they're 400 in total for the three panels so 300 is quite substantial from an output yeah, point of 300 view. watt and that's at a speed of 10 knots um so you know they they power up in anything above three knots mm. so you know i mean at the end of the day like you know if that's five thousand two hundred dollars i think i'm hoping that we've got some sizable discount coming from them as part of a deal we're trying to work with them um yeah <coughs> It's a sponsorship of sort. Mm. We're not looking to get money from them. We want to offer discounts to our entrance. And that's a sponsorship that hopefully they'll put forward. So fingers crossed for that. But they look awesome. They're just a one meter fin that hangs off the back. There's very little drag on them. Wow. And huge power. So I think you'll actually find this system, not in the next, in the 1718 Volvo Ocean Race, but they have a vision of going fossil free, uh, fossil fuel free in the Volvo Ocean Race. Wow. And That's I a think you will forward. actually find the next generation of boats will be powered by these things. Because wow. they're one design boats. So mm. if they've all got them, they've all got them. Yeah. Well, and instead of having to run those dedicated generators daily to top their batteries, that'd be, a, that'd be a great step forward. So it's where we're going. We've got hybrid engines in boats in the past. We're getting hybrid cars. Germany's looking at banning fossil fuel cars after 2030. Wow. So if cars aren't in them, 
Why are we using them in sailboats? Well, and life's easier. I mean, <coughs> if you don't have to plug into shore power around your engine. I mean, I've, I've just put solar on because uh, down on the Gold Coast, um, quite often there's not enough wind for the wind generator to be effective. And, and if you're in an anchorage for a few days, just running your engine for the sake of it, it there's no enjoyment there. Um, and the, here's the trade-off, right? You've still got a fuel cost and you've got an engine wear and tear cost. It's not that running your engine's free. So when you're thinking about the value over time of uh, other forms of you know, power generation, you've got to look at the cost of your engine use and maintenance and fuel over time. It's not, it's not a free resource. Well, in the last um, uh, Vendée Globe, there was a boat that actually was going fossil, f- uh, fossil fuel free. Mm-hmm. Um, didn't get a lot of publicity because it wasn't one of the quicker boats. Um, but his deck was covered in those um, flexible solar panels. So even on a race boat, you can do this. Yeah. Because how much deck space on a race boat do you never walk on? Yeah, that's right. You can, um, you... So, you know, just looking at those alternatives, you don't have to have the big bulky solar panels. Mm. You know, the, the, the technology's there. We've just got to think about it. So to be motivated to think differently, be creative. <laughs> Okay, so with with the race, so how many how many entries do you do you expect, or what's your what do you think the range will be? Do you have any kind of guesstimate um, in your wildest dreams as to what it could be on the start line uh, when it comes to August next year? Wildest dreams. Oh, I, people keep asking me this question, and I have no answer to it. Um, we got three boats now. Um, we've got a race. If we end up with 10 boats, awesome. If we end up with 20 boats, mm. awesome. It's it's not about how big it is to me. It's about making sure that if we got three boats, that those three boats achieve their dream. Mm. If we have 100 boats, we've got to cover 100 boats, and we've got 100 boats achieving a dream. That's more important to me than numbers. Mm. Um, obviously, if we end up with 100 boats blow my mind for starters like a hundred boats <laughs> a few logistical issues like, come out of that <coughs> we might need a few more crew to run the race um, but that's alright um, yeah, I don't have a wild mm. expectation I don't have a number that I dream of just want people to achieve their dreams mm. and come on out and if they've got questions give me a call Like I'll talk to anybody um, drop me an email I'll respond to every email I'll help people try and get to that start line. That's what it's about for me. Mm. Well, that's that's great, Ian. And I mean, there's this little old race called the Solo Tasman Race, which runs every four years that most people have never heard of. And you know, ten, fifteen, twenty odd boats turn up every four years and leave New Plymouth and sail to Malulabar, and you know, so for people to be able to you know achieve things like this, they want to achieve, you know, with with the with the flexibility that the format creates and 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 the sheer number of boats that are potentially attracted to it it's um it's got all the potential to be to be very satisfying for a lot of people for a lot, whole lot of different reasons um, it's also a bit more achievable than a solo trans tasman um the problem with the solo trans tasman is solo and you're offshore yeah and it's a, tan- and no it's a tasman. insurance <laughs> company will touch you around australia when i went around i was on a club marine insurance policy mm-hmm 200 nautical miles from land. You're going to stretch the boundaries across the south, the um, southern ocean there. But <coughs> most of the time, you're within 200 nautical miles of land. Mm-hmm. We'll talk to the insurance companies and see who's going to come on for you know to try and support the teams who are trying to do this event, um, so that hopefully they'll offer discounts as well. Mm-hmm. When we sailed offshore, we went with Pantania, so they have an offshore like. Uh, cruising insurance I don't know if they cover racing or not they do I use them in fact I just had my policy extended for uh, for Sydney Southport because they've got a it's a length of race rather than the distance offshore and term, well, in terms of the Australian policy and up to 250 nautical miles is the first level of racing cover yeah. club racing up to that and then they've got over 250 which of course Sydney Southport and Sydney Hobart and that kind of stuff. And that's that's pretty my excess hasn't, hasn't changed uh, the, it's added $900 to the year for the policy but it covers all of the racing activity. Uh, yeah, so it's actually know. quite reasonable. And I found they're the best. I had a, another company I used, but um, through my good behavior of five years of having nil claims, my excess progressively got marched from $2,000 to $15,000. And I couldn't get any explanation as to why. So, yeah, I, so I changed to Pentanius. <clears throat> yeah. So just being achievable, as I say, like it's one of those things. You can fly crew to Cairns and pick up 
you know, swap your crew out who are tired from the trip from Sydney to Cairns. I, I've got a pretty good bet that we'll have quite a few boats stopping in Broome. Um, why wouldn't you? <laughs> it's Broome. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's hard to get there by plane. It's really hard to get there by boat. But in this race, you're going to be sailing straight past the doorstep. Um, <clears throat> after that, do you go into Bunbury like I actually did? Um, <laughs> it's not far from the corner there at uh, Cape Lewin and stop in there before you go across or do you sail around the corner into Al- Albany mm-hmm. before you sail across down to Tassie? Who knows? It's going to be really interesting to watch that side of it from being stuck on land and probably with itchy feet. Mm. My wife's looking for a ride on a boat. She doesn't even want to sit with me and watch the boat. She wants <laughs> to do it. So, yeah, it's interesting. Well, and it's... It, this, it brings so many different variables, like you say, like an incredible number of variables with the ability to choose when you stop um, and, and, and to work that around, you know, weather being fav- a factor as well. Uh, clearly stopping for a day when there's no wind is going to be more advantageous than a 20 knot, 20 knot tailwind. Um, so how you time all of that is going to create all sorts of, I'm sure it's one of those races if you get, you know, a dozen boats or more, the, the lead will chop and change many times. Um, yeah, um, and to finish first, first you must finish, as they as they say with many marathons. Yeah, but being able to stop and do some repairs, even if you use more than the eight days, so what? Um, mm. As long as you finish, because crossing that finish line. Okay, in my solo <coughs> round Australia, um, I had to stop, but I still crossed the finish line, and it was the best day of my life. Yeah, it's an interesting. It's interesting to say that, Ian. And I think sometimes you find with these things, people. People think they set out to do it for all sorts of external reasons, you know, competing in a race and what have you, but often when they finish the race, they realise they did it for a whole lot of internal personal reasons, and regardless of the external outcomes, that, that that's a far greater life-lasting, you know, sense of achievement and satisfaction than anything external that you can be sort of given or awarded. I launched Ocean Crusaders off the back of my trip around Australia. Mm. What else is going to be launched from it? Mm. Who's going to be able to do what? having been able to done this, do this race. Who knows? Mm. Who knows? It's just uh, one little drop starts off a, that, <coughs> that ripple effect that, that gathers all of that momentum. Yeah, look, as I say, it's about people achieving their dreams. And if people can achieve their dreams and I've helped them do that, then another tick in the box in my, my life achievements is to be able to get these boats around Australia to be able to save a few turtles' lives, um, to raise awareness of plastic even while doing this race. Mm -hmm. Um, Having, you know, as you say, half a dozen or a dozen boats going around and being able to send the message out through them as well um, rather than just me going around solo. Mm. When I went around, no one really, apart from Sail World, running an article every day. We didn't end up on the TV or anything like that. Who knows what will happen with the media on this race because it's a pretty major race. Mm. Absolutely, and it's very Australian-centric as well, uh, with it being around Australia. Yeah, we just need a big, good old Aussie sponsor now, and we'll be fine. <laughs> well, there's a little bit of time. Some would say there's not much time, but, you know, there's quite a bit of time, and, and get the, 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 the sooner you can gather, you know, momentum and interest now, then who knows what could unfold just in the next two, two or three months. To be honest, we haven't even chased sponsors yet. We wanted to get a few entries in first and get a feel for it before we decided to do it, but yeah. uh, we'll start chasing them now. Okay, well that's good. Um, so, um, when, so when you sailed around the country, and, and clearly if you're living on small small pockets of sleep, you know I guess there's a there's days where you're just enjoying the the wild beauty and the aura of it all, and there's days where you think I just want this to be over. I'm I'm tired and grumpy. What 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 were the memorable parts of the trip for you? Um, well, <clears throat> some of the things that a lot of people wouldn't realise is what sleep rest deprivation can do to you and um, I tell this story now but I didn't even tell it when I was out there especially to my mum because she was panicking as it was me being out there but um, sailing down the west coast uh, sailed right across the top uh, from Ely Beach to Carnarvon we flew around there I think we were averaging 11 knots like the wind was behind us and we were just off happy Mm. days get to Carnarvon the weather forecast were all telling me to go into the shore you'll get this run down the coast happy days <coughs> so I went in it wasn't there there was no wind all four forecasts that I was using said the same thing and nothing was there so we spent two days getting back out we missed the front 
sailing down the coast, I was each day wasn't on a big budget, so I'd call in on the satellite phone to a friend, and they'd write the report and put it out to Sail World. And well, three days in a row, I was ringing my own mobile because she had my mobile, and I got my own voice on the answering machine. So. I was speaking to myself and it was the only <laughs> contact I had. And I kind of got a little annoyed the first day and the second day was very annoying and the third day I was pretty livid. So I rang mum um, just to hear another voice. But coming down the coast there, because I'd missed the weather window, instead of getting in front of a huge front that came through, I ended up in it. Mm. And this was off the coast of Perth. Perth had 60 knots that night. I don't think I quite had 60 knots on the boat. But... Rather than sailing downwind to Cape Lewin, I got absolutely hammered on the nose, 35, 40 knots on the nose on a boat that was made to go downhill. Mm. I was tired, I was grumpy, I was cold. The boat felt like it was breaking. I actually was sitting there on a beanbag downstairs, wet, miserable, planning how to sink my boat. To all insurance companies out there, don't listen. <laughs> um... <coughs> I was, I was in such a mental state that I wanted it out. Wow. I couldn't fail by just giving up. That's just not who I am. Mm. But that's where I was sitting. I was thinking, I'm going to sink the boat. And hang on, I don't want to sink it out here. It'll take too long to get the rescue services to me. So I'll sail in towards the coast. So I started sailing in towards Bunbury. And I fell asleep. And woke up and went, what the hell are you doing? Just literally like that top of your batteries up with a little bit of sleep and suddenly you've got a whole different level of, 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 of reasoning what, what the hell are you trying to sink your boat for but yeah just mm. that sleep deprivation wow. was the hardest thing I've ever gone through in my life I wasn't thinking about jumping off the back of the boat and killing myself I was going to get into the life raft and you just you know, no problems I just to... wanted the wanted it to stop mm. but yeah for me it was a pretty big moment in my life to sit there and, uh, and just that little bit of sleep and I woke up and I'm like, ah, oh, this isn't right. Okay, we've got to get some repairs done. So I sailed into Bunbury and just dropped the anchor and fixed my mainsail, got my engine working again and took off again. So I'm not going to say this is the easiest track to sail around in the world. I mean, it's, it's over 6,350 miles by mm. the time you actually sail. So everyone's going to face some pretty wicked challenges. At least you'll have someone else on the boat to help you and to talk to. Yeah. But finishing? Highlight of the race. Mm. Sailing across, I was, I was fortunate enough to have done it out of the um, the Whitsunday Sailing Club. They supported me hugely, a lot of mates up there. <coughs> and I happened to be <coughs> arriving on a Wednesday afternoon. So they actually had Wednesday afternoon sailing on. And oh. I was arriving before the race and every single boat came out came over and sailed past me to congratulate me before they went to the start line of the race. That's a pretty magic way to finish. It was cool. It was really cool. Mum was up there on one of the boats that I worked on and, you know, it was just... What an achievement. You, you, you finish the line, you've achieved something massive. Mm. So from halfway around wanting to give up to actually achieving the goal, uh, just two total contrasts of life, probably the lowest point in my life ever mm. to the highest point in my life ever. Um, so, yeah, achieve your dreams. Like you got to you know, never give up. And, and I, I wrote a book afterwards called Dare to Dream, and it was all about encouraging people to just go for it. Like mm. stop living within like you know your comfort zone. Get out there, have a go. Um, okay, if you, you're gonna fail sometimes, but get up get off the off the ground and go again it doesn't matter whether it's your business whether it's your family life whether it's a running race or a race around the country unless you have a go you're never going to know and dying with regrets probably one of the biggest regrets you'll ever have yeah, absolutely so yeah just to me that's why this race exists mm. just allow people to achieve a dream that so few people will ever do um, or so pe few people have done. If Jamie Dunross can do it as a C5 quadriplegic, anyone can mm. do this. Anyone can do this. I'm hoping that, you know, maybe 
a few boats will actually get together, you know, the corporate boats that um, and do something like a clipper, mm -hmm. where you can have people who have never sailed before. I haven't been in touch with any of them, but I will be touching base with them. I know there's like four Volvo 60s in this country. That would be ideal for it. That'd be perfect. Um, a, what a great culture and team building exercise, and, and the ability to change out employees on different legs, so that so that you have this this um, marathon type event, but you can you can tailor it to businesses' needs as well. That's a pretty cool idea. Spirit of the Maid, 2001 Volvo 60, sitting up at Hamilton Island for sale, 150 grand. Gosh, wow! Like that's its for sale price. Okay, you probably have to do some work to get it on the water and get it ready for the That's race. That's a great starting point, though. Volvo 60 is going to smash this course. 78% mm. downwind for me. Mm. That's what those things were made for. Yeah. Going around the Southern Ocean. Yeah. So, yes, um, Spirit of the Maid. Merritt's got new owners. Um, you've got um, Southern Excellence. Mm -hmm. The Volvo 70 hits on the market. I don't know the price of that one. Some pretty cool boats on the market. I mean, there's even a TP52 for 180 grand down in Sydney. I mean, that would be a smoking boat to do this trip on. Mm. Some pretty cheap boats out here. So, and people overseas, I'm sure there's some boats out here that. Well, there's lots of Whitbread boats still floating around that are now used as sort of charter and tourist boats that would still be <coughs> fit for purpose. With a but even a fleet of Sydney 38s. Mm. Great boat to do this trip on. Uh, good if you had a class, a one or two classes where they where they took that kind of approach with with another race within a race type concept. Yeah, like even the class forties, um, we've had an interest from one already. Um, mm -hmm. There's not too many in Australia, but uh, it's certainly a class that I think we'll build in Australia because they're two-handed boats and perfect for this race. Um, so, who knows? Hopefully, we'll get some sort of class going, and um, yeah, who knows what'll happen? We it's it's an open slather at the moment and we're mm. open to anything and ready to listen and definitely ready to take entries and help people achieve their dreams. And um, and with this type of race, Ian, like logistically what you know, if you if you you know, with you know, 10, 20, 30, 40 entries, what logistically what has to happen, um, other than the start finish line, is there anything you need to do logistically around the country from a safety support logistics compliance point of view? What what, what happens? Um, <coughs> we're, we're basically uh, there will be a tracking system mm -hmm. <coughs> there has to be to know where everyone is yeah. um, but also everyone has to have a shore based uh, contact so that we know that they're in touch with someone on the shore um, when they're, when people are doing their pit stops we need to hear from them so that um, you know, we know where they're going in Yeah. Um, obviously we will have a lot of contacts I mean I know most of the marinas around the country Um so, you know, if you need a mainsail repaired in Broome, that we've got someone sitting on the dock waiting for you when you get there. Mm. Um, because on a boat, you don't want to be organising that stuff, but we're happy to do that. Um, yeah, and a day's and a short amount of time ashore, right? Even even with the best laid plans. Yeah, but they can do it after every race day at uh, Hamo mm. and uh, Early Beach Race Week, certainly. Like, you know, you break a sail there and it's back on the dock first yeah, thing in if, the morning. If, so. if, if you organise with the right people in place, everything's doable, right? So, you know, if, if people are there and, you know, just even people from the yacht clubs, you know, maybe willing to come and support people who are coming in by running them down the shops rather than having them get a taxi or picking up people mm -hmm. from the airport. Or if you've got crew flying in there, you know, maybe, who knows, yacht clubs can, can help out. When Jamie Dunross pulled into the Wet Sundays, I contacted the Wet Sunday Sailing Club and said, this bloke's coming, help him out whole fleet were out there to greet him and he wanted to move to the Wit Sundays after that event so <laughs> you know your clubs around the country if we've got boats coming into you like we'll be looking for your help and I'm sure people will be willing to help and just listen to the stories those people mm. have, and have a beer because I'm sure people will be having a beer if they do stop yeah um, you know so it's yeah it's it's Australia wide race well it creates quite an opportunity for like away from the typical you're a stopover port or you're not, anyone can be a stopover port within reason, right? So in, in an unplanned kind of way, there's all sorts of ports and stops and marines around the country that may get a boat just stopping for whatever reason that they get the ability to host and, and, and spend 24 hours with and help out and you know create a, all sorts of local interest from a 
from a from just the Joe public wanting to come down and see a, a boat that's part way around the country. You know, it's quite it's quite a it's quite a cool concept. It's just it's really it's a really interesting format that I haven't haven't really seen or, or thought of before. But it just it, it hits so many nails on the head. I think in terms of the flexibility. It'd be a very interesting uh, scenario if the Sydney to Hobart allowed it, because how many boats end up in Eden? Mm. Imagine if you could pit stop at Eden, do yeah. those repairs and keep going. I mean, it'll never happen, but you know, you sort of sit there. You'd have so many more finishes if you could do that. Yeah. And and a club like you know Coffs Harbour might sit there and go, oh, we're so close to the start. You know, no one's going to pull into our club. Have a look at the uh, Vondo Globe race. How many boats break the first day? And yeah. then they've got to go back. Mm. Like So, you know, boats could even be pulling in at pit water. You don't know. <clears throat> if damage happens, at least with this concept, pull in, get it fixed, continue racing. It allows you to do that. As long yeah. as you don't pull the boat out of the water. So don't hit anything underwater. Yeah. Well, and here's the thing, right? I mean, if you... Just hypothetically, if you're a cruising boat and you average six and a half knots, right? Well, that's a thousand hours of sailing you're going to do. And a thousand hours of sailing, it's probably, who knows? I don't know, five years of club racing, you are going to break stuff, right? Stuff's going to wear out. You can't carry speeds for everything. So there is that unpredictability and that need to improvise. That, oh, it's all part of the magic, I think, in terms of. Yeah, the, the, don't the race expect format. your sails to be in very good condition when you get back. Um, <laughs> six and a half thousand nautical miles of sailing is going to put some wear and tear on a set of sails. Yeah. Um, but one hint I will give you is make sure you leave with damn good sails um, I didn't mm-hmm. um, my m- main sail delaminated when I put the third reef in and that was off in the storm over in Western Australia Right. and so for the second half of the trip I couldn't take it, take it, the reef out I sailed uh. with the third reef for the second half of the trip because the rest of the sail was destroyed so leaving with the right equipment and this is why I say my phone's always on my email's always open I'll help you get to the start line but I'll also make sure you're ready for the start line as well um, because I learnt a lot of things Bruce Arms who owns the multi-hole record I'm sure would be only too happy to talk to anybody uh, Mm -hmm. about how to run your drogues Uh, a lot of people don't realise that in the Southern Ocean he nearly ended up being pulled off his boat Um, he was racing along and put the drogue out it got tangled or something was in it he tried to pull it in ended up with a loop around his ankle and his drogue trying to pull him off the boat. Ooh. Very, very lucky guy. Um, so I'm sure you'll be happy to... You know, we've, we've learnt a lot. Dave Pesco's probably got some stories to tell as well of, like, when he went round. Um, so, you know, there's a lot of lessons to be learnt. Um, there's a lot of lessons that will be learnt. Mm. But preparation of your boat, key, number one factor. It's got to be ready. Not just to sail to Hobart. Mm. This is going around the country. This it's is uh, ten, it's ten Hobarts, Hobarts, right? Ten. Yeah, I just just suddenly <coughs> thought that's a it's, a it's a quantum leap when you think about that. And across the Queensland border, you haven't even done a Hobart. Mm. You know, you, you've only just begun. Mm. You know, even ten percent of the way when you cross into Queensland. Um, so it's a long way. So just along those lines, then, and you know, you know, if you look at the, you know, I guess a different example, but the. And Atlantic Rally for Cruisers, which you know is I don't two hundred and fifty odd entries each year. Now they they run a number of you know seminars or workshops leading up to that to prepare some of the the novices for these types of things. Have, have you got any plans or given any thoughts to some of the resources that may help the average boat owner plan something like this, where they haven't done anything category one or been offshore before like this, um, where they're having to prepare for that kind of long distance self sufficiency marathon marathon type event where it's not like you can just you know, even even with eight stopovers, you still need to prepare and plan. You're not always gonna have everything within reach and, and you're not gonna get around if you don't mm. think about these things and plan properly. Certainly we'd love to travel around and do some workshops before we go. <coughs> um but, you know, it's gonna come down to the funding that we've got available from sponsors, um, because we won't put that funding onto, you know, the the competitors. Mm-hmm. Um, if we have to do a webinar or whatever, uh, webinar. We I was say is a good, a, probably a good um, alternative. Um, so, you know, at the end of the day, um, we're here to help, and we'll find a way to do it. And yeah, just a matter of when and how, and and listen to them. At the moment, it's still over a year away, and as we get closer, you know, within six months of it, certainly we'll be wanting to start talking to competitors more often and yeah. find out where they're up to. Um, 
you know, in the Golden Globe race, Don was telling me people are already preparing, and that starts in 2018. Mm. Um, their boats are getting ready already, so, you know, yeah, obviously a year is going to disappear pretty quickly when we all think about having to work and, and get a boat on the water at the same time. But, um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's nothing over the top of what you would normally do on a boat. No. It's just... You might have to add a few systems. You might Just want to put that wind generator on. You might want to put the solar panels on and getting them fitted early, making sure those systems are operating correctly, yeah. trying them in a race beforehand is really worth it to make sure that you don't go out there with a new system. Absolutely. And your tools and your spares and your points of weakness and your, your backup plans. Um, make, make sure your fan belts are good and you've got two spares. Yeah. Yeah. I, I carry two spare sets now because yeah. I had... Uh, uh, I had this unfortunate experience of taking friends uh, away for a week and we were half an hour out of the marina and uh, the main one went and uh, I said, that's okay, we'll sort it out when we stop. But it had shot shrapnel through the other two belts that run my super alternator and they shred themselves, mm. kid you not, half an hour later. So I ended up with th- all three belts gone and, yeah. and I checked the spares and, and only only there was only one spare for the three I needed. Yeah. And uh, even though I had my... The, the, the previous owner had the boat's you know, service, engine service every year. The fan belt was 12 years old. Right. And, and you know, it's, the irony is you should just replace it before it breaks. Yeah. But it's right. a good example. If you, if you don't have spares, we were stuck for three days waiting for spares to arrive um, and not being able to run, run power and stuff. So. Yeah, and getting the right stuff, um, you know, making sure you've got your spare impellers for everything. Mm. Um, you know, it's just you're going to carry a bit more equipment on this trip than you would even going to Hobart. Yeah. Um, because, yeah, you don't want to off the coast of Broome have something go down and, you know, you don't know what you get, how long it's going to take to get to Broome. Yeah. Probably quicker than uh, you think, but, you know, you'll pay for it. Well, it's better than ending your race early just because you're, you know, you're not prepared. And some, you know, so often I've found it's the $5 part that causes you the grief. It's not that the, 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 the problem's expensive. It's just the the part's unique and yeah. without it, other things other things don't work but it's the little things that a lot of people don't look at they just go okay well you know my rudder's tight they don't pull the rudder out and check the bearing and make sure the bearing is solid it's got no cracks in it mm. um, you know you need to do that before you go around the country like this yeah you pretty much need to pull your rig down and have a rigger like scan all your rigging like we don't want any dismastings because that's going to take a bit more than 24 hours to fix um you know yeah <clears throat> When I went round, I, I, I spoke about, well, I spoke to myself about it, which you do quite a lot when you're sailing solo, <laughs> um, sailing at 90%, 100% of the time. Like, you can't sail at 110%, like, in a race like this. You you can't do it. It's not a sprint. No, and you're just going to break stuff. You know, okay, the IRC guys in a Hobart might do that, and if they make it, great. If they don't, oh, well, we tried. Yeah. This isn't about that. This is about getting to the finish line. And mm. if that means you do sail at 90%, well, you do. If you if there's a cloud on the horizon, pull the kite in. What's it going to do? Over 6,500 nautical miles? Yeah. Like, you know, a nautical mile like lost because of safety versus blowing up your kite on the second night. Mm. You know, it takes away your tactical advantage of getting something fixed later on. Um, you know, you you break something the first night it takes out a day or two of your your, your stops yeah you can't use them later um, and later on down the track you got to realize the crew's going to be tired well, they're going to be very tired and it is more likely that things are going to get broken so you know even though hobart seems really close to home with just a reverse hobart to sydney to do um hobart would be a pretty cool spot to stop and just make sure you're fresh for that last little blast. Mm. If you've got two or three days up your sleeve when you get to Hobart, perfect. Stop, yeah, you can relax, really recharge the batteries. Out, and then, you know, hopefully the weather's kind to you. Otherwise, yeah. you know, you could stop just even in Botany Bay. Yeah. And wait for the, you know, use up your days in Botany Bay if that's what you have to do. You could sail right around the country and spend eight days in Botany Bay and then finish. It can happen. Yeah, that's right. And... <laughs> You know, for preparation and, and education is a pretty key component and not just having to be Category 1 certified, but just the fact that in that many days of consecutive racing, you have chafe, you have things that, bolts and screws that come loose, you have all sorts of things you have to manage that are quite different to the normal 
just going out for a day or a week. Um, and, and so much of it is about just boat management within the within the constraints of comfort, not pushing pushing and breaking and having things come apart or having crew come apart. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, even your main sort of like, you don't want to sail around the country with the main at full the whole time. I'll tell you that now because your halyard's going to cop a hammering if you do that. Mm. Um, throwing in a first reef and get some stress off that point or just, you know, slacken it off a little bit in the light winds just so it moves an inch so you're on a totally different wear point on the sheaves. Yeah. It's all things you've got to consider when you're doing this race because, you know, six and a half thousand nautical miles on a halyard. It's a long way. Mm -hmm. Six and a half thousand nautical miles on your steering gear. It's a long way. It's you've just got to constantly think of all this stuff beforehand, and just like our plastic, uh, you know, motto of prevention's better than a cure. Yeah. Same with your boat. Yeah. You know, preventative maintenance is a hell of a lot better than fix it maintenance. Yeah, absolutely. Um, which so many people do. So you know, you make sure your boat's ready. Um, have your oils on board just in case you need to top up. Um, not that we want you using that, but you know you may need that as a backup. Mm. You still need it to start to you know go in, in and out of the port. Uh, we're not making you sail up onto a berth. You know you can stop racing and go back to that point when you decide to go ashore. Yeah. Um, you know, it might be a hundred miles that you have to go back south because you've decided you're going to motor that hundred mile. Who knows? This is all part of the tactics and fun of this race and and the challenge. I think. It's um it's certainly fascinating. I guess and I guess my last question for you, Ian, is um, you know the the Vendée Globe and the Volvo Ocean Race have done, I think they've done an excellent job in the last couple of events. Have really started to engage a, a wider audience, and and they've done things with you know virtual gaming and virtual racing and live tracking and you know media reporting from on board. And you know, there's a bit of controversy at the moment because they said, oh, we need to have a media person on board the Vendée Globe boats um, if the Volvo guys have done it and. The Vendée Globe guy said, "But hang on, it's a solo race. What do you mean someone else on board?" So there's a, I'm not sure where that's going to end up. But have you, have you given thought to, you know, a, a technology plan, tracking plan, you know, live up, live broadcasting, updating plan from a, from your point of view with this race to help make it accessible and make it interesting and and, and keep that attention. Um, the reason I ask is we um, we had a Costa Paradise race, which is not a 150 mile race back in January, and for the very first time, the club had trackers on the boats. Suddenly we have people on Facebook, friends, family, watching our perform, watching our results, and you know, you know, slowly those things move up the screen, right? Doing six or seven knots. But the fascination was, I got a real taste of. It's not just these big races that that that, that gather interest. Even even a smaller format, um, you give people access to the technology and the and the, and the, the data and the information. They, they you really start to get engaged with it. Yeah, trackers will definitely be on the boat, and there'll be a. Um, interactive sort of system that you can we're, we're highly likely to use yellow brick tracking mm -hmm. um, for it because it's quite a simple box that you can put on board and, and away you go um, but there will also be a virtual regatta going around um, we've just got to decide what boat we'll use for the virtual regatta because we can't obviously so many different boats in it that um, you know the virtual regatta has to have one particular boat but of course um so whether we use a volvo specs or a tp52 i don't know um we'll talk to the virtual regatta guys about that um they they set up a race for us when we tried to go around australia in 2011 on brenda bella um unfortunately the boat never went um but um we still held the virtual regatta and people all around the world were racing around the country too wow so you find out where the, the boats are on the tracker and then you go to your system and you go, okay, you know, well, where, where are we going? And so they race around the country. So, um, And that always creates lots of social media and everything like that. Onboard reporters, um, we're setting it up so that people have um, satellite communications mm -hmm. so that we can talk to them, we can still get photos off. I mean, these days... Um, the Iridium Go, we came across with the Iridium Go, which was uh, we purchased through predictwind.com. Yeah. Um, you end up with your own tracker as well for your own website. So apart from oh, that's cool. having your, um, you know, for people who are cruising offshore, like we, you know, our parents knew where we were the whole time and how fast we were going. And mm. when it failed for whatever reason, they're like, why are you back in that country? That can be good <laughs> and bad. But um, at the end of the day, like uh, that allows you to get your weather data down. It's 125 US a month for unlimited data 
Wow, and, that's actually um, really, really affordable. And uh, what was it? Uh, 150 minutes talk time. So anywhere in the world or just coastal any, Australia? Anywhere in the world. I need to tell Andy Lamont, he's sailing solo around the world in a SNS 34 shortly. He, yeah. he assumed it was going to be thousands of dollars. Um, it's, but um, if really you get the external aerial, aerial, I think it's $1,600 to buy the unit. Uh-huh. Um, but then after that, yeah, it's 124 oh, that's 95 really a accessible. month. really accessible. Yeah. Um, and unlimited data. Like, okay, it's downloading at iridium speeds, which are glacial at 2.4 kilobytes per second. Yeah. But um, at the end of the day, like, y- you can actually still get your news. I'm just going to make a note of it. Um, yeah, that's um, great. And, and your weather as well. Yeah, the weather's really important. Um, when I went around Australia, I wasn't really getting weather because I was running... I didn't really have a satellite system. I, I did have a satellite phone, but the internet was hopeless on satellite phones back then. Mm-hmm. Now it's it's brilliant because, yeah, you've got this system. And in 2017, there are some areas that are going to go to 3G speeds on the Iridium network. So if we get to that, then these devices... Like when we left uh, Croatia... We were getting, um, I think we were getting uh, 50 minutes of talk time. Still unlimited data. Mm. But then the, the plan changed to have 150 minutes of talk time, which was great. We're in the middle of the ocean and Annika's calling her mum back in Sweden. It's pretty cool, and, isn't know, it? I can call my mum and mm. uh, call your friends and sort out things at home still. So yeah. Um, it's nice to have that security like out there and it's actually got an SOS button on it which you know will send a, a message to all the different people um, on, and a set up email so it's a, a fantastic system so that's on predictwin.com and okay. um, they were sponsoring our campaign they still do so well worth talking to, to John over there and um, his weather forecasts are brilliant you can download that on your, your tablet mm. um, and the cool thing with the Iridium Go is that it's like a Wi-Fi dongle on your boat. And then you use your standard, um, whether it's your computer, your phone, your tablet, as your device to talk on. Oh, right. So, so, yeah, so you know, just your iPhone nicely. becomes your handset. Yeah, right. Well, the, and you just oh, that's two great. Programs how, you have to, so how good is that? Technology's coming to allow us to get yeah. more stuff off boats and at a respectable cost. Like, you know, as you say, 125 bucks. Like, I think think it's 50 bucks to connect it but mm. so what it's yeah the security that's involved in a satellite phone to make sure you've got it fantastic if you don't want the outside aerial i think you can get it for about a grand yeah they're, they're pretty cheap so yeah that's um, great that's yeah and it's not even like the old brick phones anymore they're, they're tiny so yeah okay cool well um is there anything else you want to tell me about the the race or the plans or anything else at all before we wrap up again I think we've covered most things. You know, to me, it's about achieving your dream. And that's what this race is about. Go hard, sail around the country, and experience that feeling of finishing. If you've ever finished a Hobart, you know what it's like to finish a Hobart. To finish 10 Hobarts in one sail, it's a pretty damn good feeling, and it'll be a highlight of your life, and a, a definite achievement, and it'll change the way you look at life. Mm absolutely so if you're thinking about it please contact us talk to us um, if you're looking for crew if you're looking for a boat get on the website let us let us know and we'll try and hook you up um, that's what it's about okay yeah. and the website address is it's around Australia yacht race.com it's a long one but it's easy to get to yeah and we'll link to it from the podcast episode and we'll also create some show notes off this episode and link to it uh, and, and the Ian's details from there as well so you can check that out um, through wonderful. the podcast website and uh, I'm sure we'll uh, we'll look to catch up um, over the next few months as we get closer um, for a ch- ch- check in with you and see how things are progressing and and um, I'm sure this will be a really really fascinating episode for our listeners um, and I'm sure if you're thinking about doing this race you know it's a, it's um, just over 12 months away um, there's time to prepare and plan it's a coastal race around Australia it's accessible it's a uh, it's a cost-effective way of doing it, and I know when I um when I took a screenshot of the 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 banner on Facebook and put it on my on my Facebook group with my crew, I got 18 crew that sort of share that page. Um, there was a lot of interest straight away. Um, in terms of I said, are you thinking what I'm thinking? Um, uh, you know, suddenly the mind starts thinking about how can this be possible as opposed to it's not possible, and there's lots of ways it can be possible. So particularly with your resources, your your advice and support, um, and the ability to help people find boats or crew. Um, then I'm sure that you know we, people can make this happen and and uh, 
you know something that they'll remember for their lifetime um yeah, there's not too many times you're ever going to be able to do something like this. And as you say, if you can do it once, fantastic. If you get to do it twice, you're pretty privileged. Mm. Um, but, you know, if, you, if you're dreaming of doing it, well, let's do it. That's great. Well, thanks, Ian. And thanks for, I mean, thanks for getting behind the, the creation of the, this, uh, the new chapter of this race. And, and good, luck, good luck and all the best. But I, I think it's going to be, I think it's a fantastic concept. And I... I truly wish you all, all, all of the success, and I think that all the ingredients are there now. It's just a matter of um, making people aware of aware of it and get the, getting them thinking about it. And I think it's going to truly become a, a great a great spectacle and a great opportunity and and a, and a great uh, endeavour that that many people um, decide to uh, you know aspire to do. Yeah, well, I think it's a it's an awesome thing, and uh, the more people that get involved, it'll be awesome. Great, thanks, Ian. Look forward to catching up again soon. Thanks again. Thanks for listening to another episode of the Ocean Sailing Podcast. Email your comments and suggestions to david at oceansailingpodcast.com.au. See you next week. People walk into me and say I'm sorry. I want to look back, I want to talk to them Sometimes I wonder how they've lived a life like this before Some are just so damn young So turn around and hear them speak So turn around and help them out Turn around you're watching them cry and watching some getting ready to die then knocked down to the ground and can't get back up feelings are sad I want to be mad days here are like precious gold if you live another one you have faith to carry Turn around and hear them speak So turn around and help them out Turn around cause you're watching them cry And watching some getting ready to die Some getting ready to die.